Good morning. Good morning, and uh, thank you for coming in this very ungodly hour. Uh, and uh, if you ever commuted from San Francisco, it's horrible. That was my, like maybe like once in a year. Um, I cursed at Benoit a lot because like that was a bad idea. But anyway, we are here. So we're going to talk about Mux. Mux is our multiplexing protocol that we created at Twitter, which is open source, and it's been open source for more than a year. It is heavily used in production. Uh, I'm going to talk about the features that we are going, we are ex currently using, and I will also talk about the features we are planning to use, but not necessarily fold out the production. But before that, let me introduce myself. My uh, my name is Burke. I uh, am part of the Twitter SRE organization. Uh, uh, recently, I started in New Endeavor. I work on front-end uh, traffic management as well. Um, so this talk uh, is very identical to the one that we had at uh, Twitter SRE Open House with a couple of editions in RPC tab. Um, I will not use the entire 50 something minutes. I plan to use uh, 30 minutes. So feel free to interrupt me anytime you want. We do have time, but again, like I don't want to waste your time as well. And we'll have ample amount of time at the end of the talk. So like you can ask questions, even the things that I did not necessarily cover, but like all your questions about RPC at Twitter or Opinions I have. Opinions are like belly buttons. Everyone has one. I will have some. Um, all right. So today we will talk about RPC multiplexing. So show of hands, uh, I, I'm quite happy this is a technical conference, but like, who knows what an RPC is? Good. And I believe the hands that did not rise are either sleeping or they don't know. All right. How? <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about what an RPC is. RPC is an acronym. It stands for Remote Procedure Call. So it is the building block of the distributed systems, right? Um, we do make calls that can be satisfied for by another system. And the, the RPCs are not necessarily trivial. Um, um, there were many tries in the past. Now, who remembers Sun RPC? TCP 11. Good. I'm sorry for you. Um, so at least we're in a much better shape nowadays. Uh, we do have uh, less insane RPC protocols, and RPC is a proven pattern right now. Um, so look, we can comfortably use them and uh, rely on them to build reliable um, uh, distributed systems. But so what is multiplexing? So who knows what multiplexing is? So who thinks what, uh, they know what, what multiplexing is? Okay, so I'll give you the idea. Like, it is the ability to use a shared medium to relay multiple sessions at the same time, like, or like con concurrently. Uh, but again, this is a shared medium. Uh, you can uh, imagine um, like a TDM, time division multiplexing, or you can imagine like how your wireless works, like frequency division multiplexing. There is a medium, like you do have some identifiers or like some shares of shared medium, um, and you run multiple sessions on this single medium. So for example, HTTP is by its nature, HTTP 1.1 by its nature is not multiplexed, right? Like you, you can do pipelining. You make a request, it's the hyper supposedly, comes from that name. You make a request, wait for the response and continue. Um, but now there are additions and like, we, are, we keep fighting this thing called speed of light, which is, which is terrible. Um, like we need more systems like that. But before jumping into the more details of multiplexing, let's go back to basics. OSI, seven layer model. Who knows what this is? This is an interview question. <laughs> All right, so seven models. So OSI people got into a room and said that, wow, like the current situation of networking is such a mess, man. Like everybody keeps reinventing same things again and again. Like we have to start speaking the same language. They didn't even understand each other in their conferences. So they decided to spec something up after the existing protocols uh, became de facto protocols. So OSI actually arrived after uh, today's de facto uh, internet protocols. Uh, when TCP IP was designed, the OSI, layer, OSI 7 layer model didn't even exist. It kind of fits it. Um, but th this is the very basics of this one. That's why I want to go over uh, these seven layers and try to explain where multiplexing and what we implemented with MUX, where does it fall? 
So I have animations. Oh boy. Um, so we do have the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport session, presentation, and application layer. Let's put some names. It doesn't, may, may, maybe with this form, it doesn't uh, communicate uh, much. So, more animations. All right, we're going to talk about a, a data center-like environment. We are using Ethernet. Uh, looks like it's wired Ethernet. So at the physical layer, we do have IEEE 802.3, the physical layer, which uh, specs uh, the signaling levels and like, how you do auto negotiation, how you do um, uh, negotiate speed. And these are crucial, right? Like you have to take bits from point A to point B. And this is specced by IEEE. But these guys were so hardworking, they didn't stop there. They also decided to handle data link layer. What we generally refer to as the protocol Ethernet is this layer that we do, the, the data link layer. Sure, Ethernet definitely specifies the hardware specifics, but at 802.3 uh, MAC layer is the data link layer. And then the things that we know much better, the IP layer, which is the network layer, like a third layer, where we do have the IP addressing. Um, and of course, we had to run some type of TCP protocol on top of it, uh, transport layer. But like, if, you, if you look at the big picture, we are simply speaking HTTPS in here, right? So my application layer protocol is HTTP. But I said HTTPS. How come it's not the application layer protocol is not HTTPS? Because we are layering, right? The S portion of this one is handled by TLS. So as a, in the session layer, the fifth layer, a little bit of implementation handled uh, by TLS. So like you can have some type of multiplexing, some type of session tracking, because it's too damn expensive to do these exchanges every single time. You do have a um, session identifier, so you don't keep exchanging keys at all times. But the important thing of TLS is it changes presentation. So its presentation is not clear text HTTP. It's encrypted. It's simply a presentation protocol. All right, we got our basics. Like, what's your problem? What are you talking about? What we are talking about in here is when we do RPC, at Twitter we do use our uh, RPC protocol of choice is Thrift. So we do serialize objects with Thrift. Thrift uh, is also used in uh, used for our data at rest platform. Um, and there's there are other serialization uh, options such as Parquet. Uh, maybe they'll talk about it. no. Um, it's it's a columnar store, but it's only between Thrift and Parquet at Twitter. Um, how about RPC? RPC uses has to use some serialization and also has to provide some calling semantics, right? So Thrift does that. Um, we made this decision in 2008, seven, seven, I believe. Um, at that time, Thrift was available. Um, uh, again, it was available uh, and we went with it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is the best RPC protocol. Uh, if you ask us, like, did you feel trolled by Facebook at that time? Maybe sometimes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's our protocol choice. Thrift had a lot of shortcomings, right? Very similar to the thing that I described with HTTP. It is a hyper protocol. Although it has a framed protocol, it doesn't work as it suggests. So you make a request, wait for the answer. Okay. So this thing that I keep describing is head of line blocking. So if you think about like, how we compose these distributed systems, not everything is a single shot call, like, give me the tweet. Well, you don't generally get one tweet. You do a lot of stuff. You talk, talk to a system. You get a, a bunch of tweets. You can batch these things. But a single service can be serving multiple RPCs as well. Yeah, like you, can, you can be hitting multiple endpoints. You can easily say that, why, why are you not binding them? But this is, this is another topic. So these interactions. Uh, in our uh, service-oriented architecture are not single RPC, one-shot RPC calls. We have to make like multiple RPCs to the same system because if it was to multiple systems, that will be an easier problem. So, so calls for discrete resources are actually blocking each other. We have to wait for an answer. We have to wait for an answer. So, well, okay, you can say that, dude, that what's the big deal? Just open more TCP connections. Yeah, you're making like five requests at the same time. Open, open, five TCP connections, right? 
What's the problem? Like, who immediately sees a problem in this proposal? Show of hands, I do. All right, good. So here's the problem. New socket connections are not free, as in resources and latency. I mean, like, free is in here, is a free, is in beer. It costs us. Like, there's no free lunch. Like, if we keep creating these connections, we'll be wasting resources. Well, let's not use the negative ones. We'll be spending resources on the machines. And, like, we're trying to squeeze in a lot of stuff into a single instance, right? Like, and we, we're working with limited resources. But another thing that kills us all the time, like, my favorite feature at Twitter is fast. Are we fast? We believe so. But if we keep incurring these latencies and we, if we keep paying this tax, we cannot talk about a fast system, right? Like we have to create this connection again and again and again. Remember TCP three-way handshake? Who remembers three-way ha handshake? Good. Ah, you should interview for Twitter, man, like you. I gave you, I gave you all the interview questions already and like we're just like nine minutes in. Um, so TCP three-way handshake. Um, will incur this cost of uh, carrying a packet with, not, with, with no data at all. Like you can say that, well, what's the big deal, man? It's in the data center. What's your latency in the data center? Sure, it's a sub-millisecond. But like when you're trying to serve some requests end-to-end -end, uh, in less than 50 milliseconds in the same geographic zone, these milliseconds, these like sub-millisecond things, they keep adding up. And Unlike the good old or good bad days of uh, Ruby on Rails Twitter, it is a hugely distributed stack right now. The fan out factor is huge. So if we keep incurring this thing, uh, we'll be slower than Ruby. I mean, that's, that's not a very high bar. Um, so, so, so we should deal with this thing, right? And yeah, uh, we, we have to deal with these optimizations. Um, they're not even optimizations, but maybe they're common sense. Also, TCP slow stack, sure, good. Like you have uh, sub-millisecond latency, and we also decided to go and like buy the most expensive switches from our friends right across the street. Uh, we still have to deal with the realities of uh, 1980s uh, networking. It still haunts us. <laughs> Here's the TCP slow start. So in the data center, it is still a big deal. Yeah, we can patch our kernel. We can hack stuff and do interesting things. Across the data center, yeah, we can still do stuff. I mean, like we can do some interesting things at the edges and complete the break of our um, uh, explicit congestion notification and like queuing mechanisms, but yeah, we can we can come up with hacks, right? Uh, we can rob some machine learning too. Uh, it will be surely better. But or like from across the pub, so good. Our cross data center links are here's the money. Um, give us the most reliable connection. What about pops? What about pops in countries? So. Uh, this is so stupid, it's a secret, but like we have a pop in a country which uh, recently hosted uh, a World Cup. I didn't say the country name. Right? Um, so the connection is not like connection from East Coast to West Coast. The provider is not the same provider. Well, in terms of provider, it is the same evil provider, but still, it's not, it's not, it's not the same. The connection to latency metrics, they're not the same. So now, the, all these problems, the small problems, or the problems we already know, are exacerbated by the realities of speed of light and general human factors. And so, like, these things are huge for us. And still, keep in mind, everything I'm talking in here, in the data center, across the data centers, and to our points of presence, we're still in Twitter autonomous system. We're not even talking about latency in at internet scale, and we're not speaking MUX at internet scale anyway. So, uh, for every uh, TCP connection, you have a separate network queue, and the half of the liveness detection logic is living in here. So, well, what does this mean? It means if I lost the other side, I don't know if it is the line is congested or if the other side is dead. And if the other side is dead, I want to move on. Like, I do have, sure, like, there's this RPC destination there. <laughs> but believe me, I have 999 more machines across this, like, 1,000 cluster. 
I have to move on. I have to know if it is dead or not. Like, there's no way that we can wait for these timeouts. And, like, I need to really know if the system is capable of handling the load. Is it loaded? Is it in a catatonic state? We were talking about Benoit. Is the kernel decided to defragment the transparent huge pages and, like, taking a dump? We don't know. But we need some support. And TCP does not give us this support. Oh, boy, we need to implement something. That's the worst thing. All right, a little bit more history bashing. Um, TCP chief ally, so blessed from October 1989. I was playing with matchboxes, I was eight at that time. Um, so TCP chief allies are specified in an awesome manner, not more frequent than one every two hours. I didn't make a typo in here, it is hours. It's not, it's not minutes. It wouldn't help. It's two, two seconds would kill everything for us. Like if we do have systems with two second latency, probably Dave or I are getting paged. It's two hours. It's the kernel, not the application. So kernel sends the key allies. Your application has nothing to say about key allies. So, well, yeah, go ahead and use the blast from the past. Use the key allies for loudness detection. Turns out that also doesn't work. Okay, I, I keep talking about lines detection for sure, but what about request cancellations? How do you cancel a request? Let's talk about HTTP today, just like forget about Mux. So, you go to twitter.com. Um, somehow we failed to uh, process your request, and then you board, and you hit escape or whatever in your new Linux laptops, probably there's an open source software to hit escape. Um, what happens? Your, your browser stops the request. How does it stop the request? It, it, takes the, the, it uses the existing TCP connection socket, closes the socket. What happens when it closes the socket? It can, send, like, it can gracefully send and close the socket. Or maybe like there is another application can do something, but eventually you're closing the socket. Remember that thing, that thing that is so expensive to keep creating new versions again and again? Good, like you were trying to optimize this thing, but just to cancel, uh, just to signal a cancellation, now you're closing them. Um, that's interesting. So cost of tearing down the TCP connection is too damn high. I didn't put the too damn high guy GIF in here. Um, all right, what about availability advertisement? Like, how do we know if something is actually available? Like, sure, like it listens on a board. So you send the, the, the packet, see, and you get the CNAC. Who are you talking to? Answer. You're talking to kernel. Your application can be doing anything. It can be our Beloved JVM doing garbage collection right there. Like you have to wait a couple of seconds, or like I don't know, like somebody double freed something and we're in a state. Or I couldn't come up with some snark about Go or not JS. Sorry, um, something bad happened. Your application is not there, but you're still talking to the kernel. It's available. Sure, it opens. Uh, like it it has brought, uh, it accepts your call, not necessarily that accept, but the response to your call. But so all these problems haunted our availability and latency in the data center. That's why we thought like we should come up with something. Um, so we also wanted to, oh, while we are at it, like we understood that we are in this thing for, um, like we are going to break a lot of stuff. We will uh, reinvent a couple of things. Hopefully we will build a better wheel. And hopefully we will not reinvent a lot of, uh, reinvent a lot of stuff. But like, while we are at it, while we are in this thing, we also wanted to separate control plane from the data plane. So, so when we talk about data plane, we're talking about your client talking to your server, like a service talking to another service. Everything you keep exchanging in there is defined by your interface definition language or something. Like, but it, it is strict the business. But of course, outside of the business, there can be other issues. Issues such as like the other service decides that, well, I'm, I'm really under trouble right now and I won't be able to 
process these things. So how do we annotate these things? We used to annotate these, we still do. We annotate these things with horrible thrift exceptions, which are like loosely um, handled, and thrift exceptions are not necessarily exceptions. Thrift exceptions are just return values with an exception field set to true. It actually means that you can throw multiple exceptions with thrift, uh, which turns out to be not a good idea. I did that, and did that. Um, and it confuses all the code generators. I repeat, damn code generators. So it was making things already much more complex than they were supposed to be. At this time, we also decided we want to add out-of-band uh, control messaging as well. Control messaging that I'm going to talk about, such as I'm under load, back pressure signaling, or I'm not available, I'm just, just warming up because we run most of our systems with JVM and yeah, warm up is a thing. Like we have to load classes, we have to open connections, we have to gracefully call the first garbage collector so like our tenured generation is not that full and like we will not fail. Like these things are the realities of production and we wanted to address all these things without making the RPC portion, not the multiplexing, without making the application layer more complex. Okay, so, oh boy, back to those seven layers. I talk too much, like, tell us the, what you're building. So, we're building this fifth layer. I'm gonna lie and go ahead and say that what we build is a purely session, purely layer five, session protocol, but at the end of the talk, I'm gonna tell why I lied. Um, so, so these concerns, remember that like, I keep talking about this stuff? These concerns can all be addressed in the session layer, or as we talked. So we, need a session, we needed the session protocol. We were convinced and we came up with MUX. So MUX is an open source multiplexing protocol there is not much rocket science related to it. it. It can multiplex any protocol you want. Let's go back to here. Stuff at Twitter looks like this, right? Like there's no, if Ethernet, working over TCP, nothing in the session layer, nothing in the presentation layer, and thrift. Or like sometimes there's thrift over TLS, so you'll see some presentation in session layers, which is trivial. But then there's nothing in the session layer. So, um, this session layer protocol, MUX, can multiplex anything you want, anything at layer uh, seven. You can multiplex HTTP. Is this a good idea? No, use HTTP too. You can multiplex memcache. Is this a good idea? Mm, maybe. But is multiplexing thrift a good idea? A production experience showed us it is a terrific idea. Like we had so much latency savings, and significantly improved our availability, especially with the realities of um, uh, complicated or like deep stacks. So with MUX, we believe we implemented everything that addresses the, pre the concerns that I talked about. As an addition, we added explicit queue management. So with MUX, we are addressing these concerns by introducing a concept of NAC and not acknowledge. A very common problem with our RPC systems, things that mutate data, is when you send a request, like it's, it's out from, you, from your point of view, and you get nothing. What happened? Did it mutate something? Can I retry this? I don't know, this is the most horrible thing. Like you, you, you're not always lucky that your, all your calls are idempotent. That's, that, that, that's a lie, like, like if, if all your, Calls are like item port and you're not doing anything. I want to meet you. I mean, like, <laughs> I want to work for your company. This is so good. Um, so you mutate stuff, and it is the scariest thing ever. Sometimes you cannot retry. Like if you're doing like, especially anything that touches money, like how do you how do you do retries? Like how do you know that you do not break stuff? Of course, you can have much more complex things implemented at the application layer, making sure that the like, conflict is just, oh boy, this is not system engineering anymore. So next allowed us to return, you know what, I'm not going to handle this thing and I promise you I didn't even look at your thrift call. Like I'm in trouble right now. 
Like it might be like I'm about to do garbage collection, or like oh, yeah, my backends are completely down, and like oh my my self perceived success rate is so horrible. There's no way I'm going to satisfy your request. So like we can relay deadlines in our RPC saying that yo you know what like I need this user uh, within uh, eight milliseconds. Can you give me it in eight milliseconds? It is trivial for us to look at our self observed short-term profile and say that mm, I cannot serve this in eight milliseconds. Like I served like last 10,000 suckers in 20 milliseconds. Maybe you should try another instance of mine. With next, we can easily do that. But it can, it can even be a tweet, right? right? Like it, you are trying to tweet something. You go ahead and write it. So you have to write this tweet in like 30 milliseconds. Can you write this? Pfft, no way. And we can try others with next. This allows us, and like we can run any protocol on top of this thing. And of course, leases. Leases are also important. Like, how do we know? Every like, do we need to expect next every single time? No, that would be quite inefficient as well, right? Like, we also implemented a lease mechanism at Mux, so you can ask for a lease, and we guarantee to serve you for some specified amount of time. Uh, I think the protocol communicates in nanoseconds. Um, so if within that amount of time, you don't need to take a lease. So what does it give us? It gives us the ability to plan for our short-term capacity. If we know a server, an instance, can generally handle 20,000 requests in flight, we can have a trivial semaphore around this thing. Yeah, we do not give like issue leases to more. Like, while you issued leases and they are not making requests, you can always uh, invoke the lease, um, not invoke, revoke the leases. So this gave us the ability to do proper back pressure signaling. The beauty in here is both you can have both exceptionary uh, back pressure signaling or planned back pressure signaling. So if we are talking about an instance where like, we ran out of leases, it is quite obvious that we ran out of leases. So on the client side, we can easily say that, mm, I'm going to try this five times. Like outside of this, this whatever the like, cluster size is, if I am this unlucky to say that like, I got denied five times, look, there is something wrong. And we will bubble up this back pressure signal to every single system that is calling us. So this way, we can start from the bottom of the stack, let's say that we cannot write to a database, uh, to any other core service, going up to our front end server, and we can return it to HTTP 420, was it from, hey, 420 uh, and send the header uh, retry after. And this is implemented, like if you're using Twitter on a like Twitter owned and operated apps, like official apps on iOS or Android, it's implemented. We can uh, sometimes send your application, retry after two seconds, retry after four seconds, and you don't need that. We cheat you, we, we lie you that, oh, you totally <laughs> wrote your tweet, and no, we didn't. Um, it, will, it will try, and like, we will fail you gracefully. <laughs> so I was like, oh, by the way, the tweet that I told you that I wrote, and now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, all these things are now available to us that, to implement, and um, this ex explicit queue management allowed us to do this. So uh, there, there are a couple of interesting use cases in here. So uh, Mux, in addition to these features, ex ex explicit queue management, that requires destination dispatch in there. So with Mux, although I lied, it's not entirely a session protocol because now it starts to inspect the destinations as well. Remember the four layers of the, 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 the four layers that we interact in, like seven layers. With Mux, you can actually specify logical destinations of an RPC. Whoa, what do you mean? So, well, we use Zookeeper. That's no secret to do service discovery. Let's say, like, we do have um, a cluster we want to talk to. Uh, there are like 100 nodes in it. You get the list of 100, and like you pick one with your load balancer algorithm. That load balancer is a software load balancer uh, implemented in Finagle, which is also our open source RPC. You, that's easy. You picked one machine. All right. Well, you already know where to talk to. Why are you still adding the name of the machine that you want to talk to? Because you have to give the control, the RPC routing control, 
to every other downstream that you're talking to. So that downstream can do something better for you. If, it can, if it's unable to handle this thing, or if it is actually a proxy, it's not even a real downstream, it can actually serve this request while talking to a legacy system, or while talking to another data center, or while making some decisions on behalf of you. We are going to talk about this one. GC avoidance, GC in here is garbage collection. As I said, a significant portion of Twitter stack is implemented on technologies running on JVM. Um, so they used to, it used to be um, a Scala Java closure. I believe we have very little closure left right now, uh, which is the open source project Storm. Uh, we don't use it anymore. Uh, so, but Twitter stack looks like either Java or Scala, and there will be some sprinkles of C++ some other places, especially at, at the front of the stack, um, or at the bottom of the stack. So we can avoid GC. Whoa, what? Well, we do not avoid GC. We predict there will be GC, and we make sure we do not advertise availability. This has nothing to do with service discovery. We do treat service discovery merely as a gossip. There may be a system in here that might service your request. But like, you cannot rely on Zookeeper for like sub-millisecond availability uh, advertisements. You, you will kill your stack. And like, th that is too much to ask from uh, uh, the service discovery stack. I'm going to talk about this one as well. Or you can implement service-to-service -service authentication. Hmm, that's an interesting one. Does, who uses Thrift in here? Good. Uh, Looks like Pinterest, you use everything we use. Uh, like I, when I read your blog post, it really feels like Twitter blog post. Um, who else? Good. Um, so, you know, like, there's no authentication in uh, Thrift. Like, you can roll your own, that'll be definitely ugly, but the, it's not part of the spec. Even HTTP has authentication, right? Thrift doesn't have. Like, we have to have RPC authentication. We cannot allow all the systems to talk to each other freely. So do we add authentication to Thrift? Hmm, maybe. Oh, by the way, we also need authenticated memcache. So we're adding authentication to memcache? Yeah. So, oh, by the way, there's the Storm protocol, which also needs authentication because it manages my... So you see where I'm going. This is crazy. You can implement authentication at the session layer and address this once and for all. So this way, in your company, there's only one way to authenticate, and there's only one way to negotiate availability in back pressures. So that's another use case. And the addition to this one, it's oak for distributed systems. I'm going to talk about this one. Debugging distributed systems is so hard, and like so annoying. We believe that we can address this at um, session layer, and hopefully that will be open source soon. Let's talk about destination dispatch. So cool, I talked about service discovery and other stuff, we're doing crazy things, we already know what machine we're talking to, but like, we keep giving the logical name, like, not the IP address, logical name. Like I want to talk to user service, I want to talk to tweet service, these are not the services, but yeah. With destination dispatch, we know this logical name and we know what you actually want. So we can do load balancing for you. We can do much more intelligent routing for you, for less intelligent clients. Or we can completely change the destination of your cluster by observing some other features. Think about staging environments. Think about testing uh, applications internally, uh, going to test and going to a test cluster. Your app looks like it's running in production, but we have the hint, let's say it's IP address, let's say it's authentication. We can transparently send you to a staging cluster. You're not changing anything. There are no config changes. We are simply observing your current behavior and indicators, and you're running exactly the same code, exactly the same configuration flags that runs in production for staging and for testing. This is so powerful. So I'm going to give an example of load balancing uh, for less intelligent clients. This is Ruby, less intelligent one. Um, so Max proxy. Um, unfortunately, none of these are open source yet. So unicorns, I, I mean, really, this is the name. Like, I, I didn't pick up the name. And there are also rainbows. I mean, um, 
Um, so these unicorn workers, I believe, they do talk to Mux Proxy with their protocol choice. I mean, that that protocol is, I don't know, maybe it's like skinny jeans over single fixy bike, but some, something. <laughs> um, let's say it's HT, JSON over HTTP. So they, they do speak to Mux Proxy, and like they, they speak the protocol they know. Um, and like we didn't implement Mux Thrift or other stuff. It can simply be Thrift for uh, Ruby because it's like code generation, right? But they, they, they do speak, but they don't know anything about like how the deep the stack is and how complex the stack is. And like it's so complex that you have to have more creative uh, service discovery mechanisms. We do have weights now, like we can move traffic to some portion of the cluster. We cannot implement all of these things. We want to implement these things in one single place, which is finagle for us. So, Mux proxy, written in C, simply speaks Mux and carries whatever protocol that is. Let's say, in this example, it's Thrift. Huh. So, it is speaking Thrift. All I need to do is to make it speak Thrift and sound intelligent. Um, sounds like San Francisco. So, Mux router is implemented in Finagle. It simply receives the Mux protocol. Thrift is there. We don't need to touch this protocol at all. So these less intelligent clients can talk to much more complicated portion of the stack. So these service X, Y, and Z, they might be living in a in different data center. We might be in the middle of an incident. We might be in the middle of an incident that like, some portion of the requests have to go to service X, some to Y, and some to Z. Will we re-implement these things for every single client? No, it's pointless. So with Mux, with destination dispatch, you have the luxury. Of course, in this example, well, like um, before you ask this question, we do expect these things to be not high traffic. They are like low traffic that the like, Mux router is not overwhelmed. But like, keep in mind, we can move a lot of traffic and like, be simply limited by um, the network IO, uh, the network bandwidth of this box because like, we're not inspecting much at all. We're not deserializing and reserializing Swift, uh, not Swift, Thrift. So it is easy. This is destination dispatch and we do have uh, more creative users for that one. Um, oh, I already talked about that one. So Max routers at the edge of data center. This is, let's say like this, well, web host, let's assume that this can be even a data center. Um, um, so they can know about the load across different data centers, across different pops. Like if there's a global incident, we can move traffic without changing all the deciders of all the applications. Or it can be simply pre preference-based one. Like let's say that, well, we're going to test this thing and it will be on the staging. Trivial for us. Run, product, go ahead. So m more intelligent clients are generally written in Finagle. And all this logic uh, is already provided by Finagle. And a more intelligent clients uses something called deciders. You can read a Pinterest blog post to understand about our decider implementation. Um, um, they already implement these things. But of course, like there might be an application where we don't have time to add these features, or an application that completed its economical life. I don't know if such thing exists. We should ask managers. Um, so we can add these features or retrofit these features with Mux routers. So it's like there, there's nothing that stops more intelligent applications to talk to a Mux router. The beauty in here is more intelligent applications have no idea if they are talking to a real host or a Mux router. We can simply drop in something. I'm going to talk about that one too. So, Okay, let's come to GC awareness. Who runs stuff on JVM? I know you guys do. Um, you? I I'm sorry, I couldn't see. Okay, then not much. What else? Python? Like more native stack? Like C, C++? Show of hands. Are you sleeping? Show of hands. <laughs> All right, so you guys run native stuff. Okay, so, but like, people generally know about the pains of garbage collection, right? You have to go for sleep. Like we're running concurrent mark and sweep, um, but the young gen collection is stopped, still stopped the world. And like we, 
that stopped the world of 200 milliseconds is definitely SLA affecting. Um, instead of sitting down and rewriting everything in another language, so we decided to um, uh, find a, a way to go around this thing. We can easily predict young junk collection. I mean, it's trivial, right? You do have some amount of young generation, and when it fails, well, you're going to stop, and hopefully all of it is garbage, and it will take very little amount of time to do the garbage collection and move on. But sometimes things will suck because like, your downstreams are slow and you'll have a lot of tenured object, or live objects. You need to copy them. You copy them. Copying takes time. You're pausing. You're out of your SLA. Horrible. So, but it is trivial to detect this thing. So Finagle, this thing that I'm talking about is also open source. So Finagle can easily predict this thing by simply observing your uh, current usage and uh, last uh, perm gen collections and uh, create a simple profile of like, obviously how much you uh, tenure and like how much does it take to go into a GC pose. And now, just because we are speaking mugs, we can gracefully start draining our existing clients. And all of these things happens in the matter of milliseconds. We can say that hmm, I'm about to go to a young GC, so I'm giving you a lease of only 10 milliseconds because like, let's say that like, we start uh, predicting this thing like half a, se uh, half a second ago. So I have like 500 milliseconds uh, to tell everyone to go somewhere else. I'm removing all their leases. Moreover, if someone doesn't have a lease and when they come and uh, issue a, a request to me, I'm sending a NAC. So this way, the low balancer of Finagle uh, disqualifies me for some amount of time. Maybe it will not check like four seconds. Like there are hundreds of other instances that look like me, right? Now when we are drained, we can easily go to garbage collection. And we do control that strictly. We do not let it garbage collect itself or like keep admitting more requests. We simply force garbage collection. When we are ready, we expect for the clients to come back. So you'll see that your requests go up and like go down and then start building up again. But next time the clients come, I can already do allocations. So it uh, really manages our latency well. Um, I, I won't be even able to respond. Yes, when a client, oh, um, sorry. Um, so the question was, uh, when you're in GC and a, a client tries to connect to you, what happens? Can you send NAC? No, because the, the code that uh, executes sending the NAC, that, that, that code is executed again in JVM. You cannot do that. Um, so when someone tries to connect, that, that host tries to connect to me, uh, it will time out. The beauty in here is we do strictly control this in our software load balances, which is like part of Finagle. It's part of the RRPC. So uh, when you're talking to this cluster, you almost always have a good view of the entire cluster. A significant portion of your client fleet will already know that you're in GC. But of course, there are cases when like, if you're a huge cluster, let's say 10,000 instances, and obviously we do have a different load balancer for this thing, an aperture load balancer. It doesn't connect to every machine, and you can be the unlucky RPC request uh, to hit this machine, and you'll time out. But of course, the beauty in here is um, we do have much more strict connect timeout and responses from MUX. So instead of uh, like having more lenient timeouts uh, compared to like thrift stacks, uh, we can squeeze our timeouts, like first response timeouts, uh, to a degree that, oh, like, are you alive? Like, are you at least able to give me something from Max? You look like dead. Like now we are talking about millisecond accurate, millisecond precision mm, resolution timeouts. Yeah. Wait, wait, connecting is not enough. You need to get a lease also. No. 
you can, no, leases are optional. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, sorry, it's like if it sounded like that. Leases are optional. Not every client takes a lease. Like there are many use cases where leases make sense, and you can ask for a lease. But leases are entirely optional, so you don't need to take a lease. Now, like if you are this sensitive to latency, immediate latency, the right way is to take a lease. RPC authentication, I kind of talked about this one. So here's the thing, like lessons learned from HTTP. Authenticating every single request is expensive. Who knows how HTTP basic authentication works? So it sends your username and password with every single request. The last from 80s again? Uh, but it was, it was okay at that time. I'm, it's, it's quite surprising it's still okay today. But we can't do that. We can't do that. Like we do have like some bottom of the stack um, applications that like process millions of RPCs per second. I mean, like this is such a waste. We can't do that. So we want to make this thing um, uh, authenticating only your sessions. So it is not like that disruptive. So we don't need to change things. So lessons from HTTP. It is expensive. HTTP basic digest. It's disruptive. Like, like, like we could modify la layer seven protocol, adding uh, authentication to Thrift, worst idea ever, or run IPsec, good luck with your network guys. Um, or like implement it in the session layer with your own X509 or Kerberos and other stuff. Yeah, that I cannot make that comparison in here. That will be PG13. So bad ideas, like running your X509, yeah, good. Um, so we decided to use uh, something else that might, may or may not be in this slide. Um, and RPC authentication is immediately sold for us. Like we can authenticate Thrift, we can authenticate Memcache, we can authenticate anything that you imagine. But it's not fully in production. There are only a couple of systems that are using it, or some other systems are rolling their own. But we will converge to this one. All right, and the next slide. So remember that we talked about awk for your distributed systems. Debugging is debugging distributed systems is really hard. At Twitter, before launching something to production, we do run a uh, meeting called Production Readiness Review. It's uh, managed by the SRE team and the TCC. TCC is Twitter command center. Um, they watch the operations all day. Like they're available multiple places on Earth, so like they follow the sun and other stuff. So, but these reviews are tough. We expect people to be production ready, and like production is real life. It is wild. A lot of things happen at production. Things such as like saturation uh, happens, such as your downstreams are failing, your downstreams are slow, your downstreams are throwing exceptions. People never test these things when they are writing the code. They work with their RD mocks or in a staging environment, which is not loaded at all. Like nothing fails in their staging. It's, it's the perfect world. We launch something, zero day, bam. You don't see the veil anymore, but like you see the like broken robot. This is horrible. We cannot tolerate this thing anymore. All right? In the past, we asked people to implement these things, such as like simulating these things. Hey, like you can induce latency by simply adding this filter because finagle filters are. Uh, uh, bi-directional, you can simply add this thing. Yeah, do that. Oh, how about uh, errors? Okay, you can uh, add another filter for adding errors. I mean, this is a lot of work, right? So, in a Hack Week project, we came up with, this is still not open since, and hopefully we will open source it again in the finale, RPC tab. It is awk for distributed systems. Remember the Max router back there? You don't know that like you're talking to your end system or some else that speaks MUX. So this is eventually a MUX router where you can inject failure by simply look observing the destination saying, oh, Twitter user service, pretty cool. Like that thing is sometimes not reliable. Okay, here's the thing. Like I'm going to uh, add a uh, failure every five requests. Oh, that's really bad. <laughs> Or you can simulate latency. Um, what happens if this user service is so slow and your object life cycle increases and you go into GC spiral? Normally, we ask these questions in PRRs. Um, like you either get, oh, yeah, it shouldn't happen, or blank stares, or like, yeah, we tested this thing. Like, we tested this thing, and it's the most confident answer that you can give. 
But the, to give confident answers, you do not need to rewrite a framework or like, write more code than your actual application to test it. So with, with a protocol like this, you can build tools that will enable you to run awk-like queries or awk-like scripts for your distributed systems where you can inject failures, simulate latency, and even rewrite destinations. Oh, so what happens if this goes to a failed over system which has a different behavior? This exists. So with Mux, we were able to implement this thing. And this was a hack week project. I think it got implemented in two, three days. And they select for the rest of the week. So more, do you want to read more about this thing? Mux is part of Finagle and it is open source. It's been open source for more than a year. You can use it today. You can use Thrift Mux today. It is well documented in the source code, unfortunately. But I read the source code. It is good Scala code. Um, so related things to this one uh, that we talked about, you may have questions about, are HTTP 2.0 and Google's Quick, which runs th things, or UDP as well. But they are not strictly the same. HTTP 2 is a layer 7, layer 6, layer 5 protocol. Layer 6 is addressed by both HTTP 2 and TLS at the same time. Mux is more or less a session five, mm, layer five on the session protocol, with the exception of destination names. It, we can say that it's a strictly session five, uh, layer five protocol. There must be questions. So this is either a good thing or a bad thing. When there's no questions, it's like I rocked, and like there are no questions, or, or nobody understood anything that's horrible. Yeah, I'll ask a question, oh, Rick Farrow. Right. Yeah, I, how complicated is it to configure Mux? I mean, you know, you make it sound like it can sing and dance and uh, tap dance, and so I'm beginning to think of, my God, you know, setting this up must be insane. So there are no Mux settings, none. You cannot configure anything. It is strictly handled by Finagle. Ah, yeah. Oh, well, you just push the problem somewhere else. <laughs> Not necessarily, <laughs> right? Um, so. Given the fact that like, Finagle is an open source that comes out of like, Twitter's own stack, and like, we know what our own stack looks like, mm -hmm. um, and it might not be the best fit for like, any other run of the cloud virtualization, Docker in virtualization in virtualized cluster, or your choice, mm -hmm. but the chances are quite high it has a um, sound model uh, of latency and availability uh, addressing. So, um, as I said, you can only enable, disable leases, like do you want leases before making requests or not? And that's about it. Oh, uh -huh. okay. But what other configuration would you expect in Mux? That is not already addressed by TCP configuration. I was figuring you would have dials for setting timeouts for latencies, mm -hmm. um, learning, you know, you said it was predictive about garbage collection. Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought also maybe um, services could send back hints and so, say, I'm, I'm sorry, busy. That was a use case of Mux. So yes. Mux doesn't know anything about garbage collection. In that ah. example, we mm -hmm. just said that we can predict garbage collection and simply start not issuing leases and sending next. Those are simply APIs. As of today, like if you take the source code right. and want to rewrite your own GC avoidance algorithm, it is trivial. Like all the code is there. Like you can say, that, mm, I'm not going to issue leases, just a flag, <laughs> or simply send next. Okay, great. So like, there's no configuration. It's, okay. it's quite similar. It's like, like what do you configure in TLS for right. the session part? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other than crypto C. Thanks. Um, so where does uh, failure detection health, you know, go within Mux? It, does every intelligent like Mux proxy do that, or is it just learn through back pressure? How does that? So most of our stack looks like like everything talks Mux, or like, there are some exceptions at the very bottom of the stack, such as like memcache or like some like in-house. I'm sorry, MySQL, uh, some in-house database like which is old like that didn't move to Mux, but everything remaining until to our um, front end, where we start speaking HTTP again, they all speak Mux. So the back pressure goes from, generally from bottom of the stack to the top, or like somewhere from like bottom, like from, uh, bottom to top, like down to up. 
Um, so that's how we do that. There are two methods. We can either do it by next or we can implement it with uh, thrift messages. Why do we still need thrift messages? Because again, there are some apps, some, some portions of the stack that do not implement MUX. But eventually, we want to remove all these ideal editions and exclusively use the session layer because it is much more convenient. Does that answer the question? Perfect. Hi, I'm curious to know how do you go about instrumenting um, like your view of the world? Uh, like how many servers are currently uh, you know, accepting connections? How long um, uh, services take out of uh, rotation for GC, et cetera? Right. So Perfect question. Uh, again, this is part of Finagle, but not uh, only comes with Finagle. Everything else that does not use Finagle, I have to provide stats at Twitter. And like we do have a comprehensive collection. Everything goes to time series database. So we do compare these things uh, from both sides, from both the client's side and from uh, the server side. Of course, a server knows its own availability, but clients do not need to agree. We, can, we might have even by network partitions. Like client, the server says that everything is cool, but client doesn't think the same. So we do cross, cor no, not cross, cross, correlate. We do correlate these stats. Um, and we do have uh, debugging tools that are uh, that helps us to do this in real time instead of like multi-second uh, accuracy. But all these real-time tools, they are used at staging or like when we are debugging stuff. So, but the answer, the overall answer to this question is everything, clients and servers obsessively keep stats, not logs, stats. And we do have stats for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. So in the question earlier about uh, what happens when you connect to a node that's GCing, mm -hmm. um, I said, well, well, if you always get a lease, then the problem doesn't um, crop up because you have to, connecting is not enough. You first have to connect, then get a lease, and then you can start sending requests. Mm -hmm. And you said it's optional. Why is it optional? Why would you not like always just grab a lease like it, it, se it seems like it just improves the reliability of the system and uh, gets your latency profile under control. Right, but there are things which are, say, like, are important. Let's, you want to get an ID from a system, and you can like, simply retry this again later. So we did not implement these things. But like, it is, like, I don't know why it is optional, but like, we had some use cases where like, getting leases at all times didn't sound like a good idea. But yeah, I mean, it's a round trip. Yeah, you cannot send data with that. So, I don't know. That's a good question, though. I don't know the answer. Hey. So, another question. Uh, you talked about authentication. Are you also working on adding encryption there, or is that a plan? Encryption is added on the presentation layer. So, that's going to be like, if the application wants to encrypt, it needs to do it itself. Yeah. This so, it means that doesn't... maybe we decoupled um, uh, CIA, like con uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, the confidentiality portion of not not the agency. It's yeah, like ten. ten. No, <laughs> and that's that will be in the same as yeah. uh, So the confidentiality is decoupled from authentication and authorization. So like all these three, we do believe are like discrete concerns. So encryption is exclusively handled at presentation layer. If I may have another question. Yeah. So when you're actually deciding where to send your traffic or what what backend to connect to, that is also kind of out of scope of Max, right? That's like kind of load balancing decisions, which Max right. backends I want to talk do, to. Or? We do exclusively make load balancing decisions with the load balancer algorithms available in Finagle uh, that you choose. Like it can be a heap balancer, it can be like exponentially weighted moving average balance, anything that fits better to your application. But that, that load balancing decision, if you're talking to a router, or like if, if you're talking to a proxy, like that the proxy is max requests, that decision is made on that box, yes. But again, has to be either very loyal to your destination, or it should know what it's doing. Like it's there for some evil but helpful purpose to rewrite your destinations. Or not necessarily just like simply do the, exactly the same thing. All right. Thank you. That was in there. <laughs> this, time, this time I managed to get much, much better questions for thank you for the audience. Thanks.